17. Broadcasting from deep within Combine territory. It is every citizen's duty to resist the Combine and learn the truth. Stay tuned for the latest news of our recent successes in our never-ending battle to regain control of Earth. This broadcast will be repeated every hour. Transmission code 8993. Welcome, citizens. You have chosen or been chosen to listen to Podcast 17's transmission code 8993. Podcast 17 is your weekly verbal tour of the Half-Life community, including news, interviews, and chats. With me today, I have William and Emmanuel, a.k.a. No PK. What up, guys? How long did it take you to practice that? Because that was really well done. Off the cuff. So, welcome wow. everybody. We got a, a a a packed show lined up, and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, No PK? Well, uh, I definitely can't do what Philip just did, as you, some of you might know. Um, I write for Planet Half Life. I do it really mediocrely, and uh, I figured that if I came here and uh, did this show, I could make up for that. But we'll see. What about what about your first experience or first memory of Half Life? Can you uh, tell oh, us about you that? Oh, you want me, you want you want the whole spiel? Oh, I could be here all day. Wait a second. I'm not sure what he's doing. He's getting all prepped and psyched for his for his talk. Perhaps he's playing the game again just to re- relive those moments that he had first time. Anyway, William, why don't you tell us uh, tell us about your week? Oh well, I had a pretty monotone week. We've been so busy with Podcast 17 and getting it all set up and getting everything going that I haven't had a lot of time to play a lot of video games, really. I just got my new terabyte hard drive so I can have all my games installed at once. That makes my life a little bit easier. But uh, on the vein of Podcast 17, I just want to go over a few things with listeners so there's a little less confusion. Last week or in our pilot episode, so to speak, we were talking about two names. We were talking about Podcast 17 and about that beer. And as you can tell, we settled with a name. It is Podcast 17, courtesy of Ian, who won our Name That Podcast uh, contest. He won himself a copy of Left 4 Dead. So congratulations to Ian. So you can check us out at www.podcast17.com. That is our official name. Uh, we have been working on the site. It's a work on work in progress, courtesy of Nick, our producer. He's been doing a lot of really, really good work. Uh, a lot of he's been tweaking with the WordPress theme a lot. It looks great. We're open to comments and suggestions. You can check out our blog there. We have a couple links, and uh, you can check out all the information and all the episodes. So I just wanted to fill the listeners in on that because we've been so busy with the website and so busy with structuring this podcast so we can make it easy for you guys to listen and find out more information. I have to apologize. I uh, specifically set out to make sure that something wouldn't happen, and it did happen. My cats uh, really enjoy breaking things, so I had to take care of that. Anyways, back to my spiel. Sorry, William. Hate to detract. So, uh, eight years ago, I started playing uh, the video game called Half-Life, and in that video game, there was a mod called the Counter-Strikes, and I partook in the playing of the Counter-Strikes for a few years, and then I kept playing that, and then I found out that you can even do more mods, so I played some of those mods, then I went to Planet Half-Life for five or six years, then they ran out of writers, so I said I could write, they had me come on as a writer, I got rid of half of our advertising because they're ashamed of us, and now here I am doing the podcast with you guys, which are, frankly, the best thing that could have ever happened to me. I'm really looking forward to this. And that's that. Okay, well, welcome. But specifically, when you first played Half-Life, is there any emotion or any particular scene that you remember specifically? I mean, for, for example, for me, the tram ride was the beginning of the love affair. All the other games I've played up to that point just faded into insignificance. I really? was in love. Absolutely. You know, it's funny you mention that because I was playing that uh, that mod that you guys were that you guys have been playing all week, and so I thought I'd give it a shot. Half Secret. It did the the tram thing too. And I couldn't help but think, seriously, again the tram thing. I have to sit here for ten minutes and stare at stuff that I've already seen twenty times. Granted, it gets way better afterwards, but for me, the the entrance for me into Half Life was. 
Oddly enough, it was Counter Strike because Half Life didn't interest me at first. I thought, well, I already played Goldeneye, so I'm kind of bored of first person shooters that you run around and play in single player. But for me, it was just the the culmination of of the the modding community and the and the multiplayer aspect. I had never played a multiplayer game where you could have 32 people on a single server like on D Dust and just go to town on people with headshots and calling each other's mothers fat and stuff like that. I thought that was really interesting. So that's what hooked me. It was the fact that there's a big world out there and that I can get it all from the comfort of my living room. Yeah, see, I didn't I never jumped on the Counter-Strike vein. I remember hearing about Counter-Strike, but to me, we mentioned this last episode, to me it was TFC. I mapped for TFC as soon as I found out TFC came with Half-Life 1. And I found that game so interesting, and I just loved it. I redefined my sniping skills, so to speak, but now I'm now I'm crap in comparison to everything else that's out there. What did you play before TFC? Nothing, really. Um, Half-Life multiplier-wise, nothing. So TFC was what got me into, other than, like you said, Goldeneye. I mean, I played Goldeneye on my N64 with people. Oh, yeah. But see, that was with four. That was with three other friends and like four pizzas on a Saturday night. Whereas now I had an excuse to never do homework and to never do anything else because it was readily accessible at any moment. I could jump into a server and play Counter Strike with Playboy sixty nine and Blazing Asian forty two, and that was always accessible. And that was awesome. The idea that I didn't have to invite my friends over to essentially procrastinate. That was great. I think I think the Half Life series really did open up the industry for um, internet gaming with the One Network and everything. That was really monumental. Don't you? But don't you think that the system was a bit like? Well, I mean, now we have Steam, so we don't ever think about it. But back in the days of One, it was pretty clunky. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever played something uh, called Rainbow Six or any of that genre of games on uh, MSN Gaming Zone. But they had the idea of, of it beforehand, and that didn't take off. And then, yeah. and then you had something like Half Life that was just as clunky, but managed to to get such a following. Yeah, I actually hated the One Network, but it worked. I mean, it worked. And I also remember going through Games by Arcade and trying to dig through servers to find my friends. Um, like my cousin would play Half Life or TFC with me, and I remember spending easily an hour trying to get in the same server with him because it was such a bad system. Oh, granted, I was young too, so I didn't understand the concept of IPs and I can just type connect and console. But the the functionality was lacking. But, keep, I mean, keep in mind, we're in North America. I know that uh, for you, Philip, it must have been a nightmare having to deal with... I know because I know 10 years ago the internet over in Europe was not up to, up to snuff, especially in, in, in certain parts of Spain and uh, I'm not sure where you were in England, but I know it was not fun. Well, I have to be honest, uh, just a secret between you and 10,000 listeners, I've never played Counter-Strike. I've never played TFC. I, I haven't played any multiplayer game. just doesn't interest me. What? The internet was pretty slow, but that was not the reason. Oh, my lord, are you serious? How could you Actually, not play Counter-Strike? I did try uh, Unreal Tournament 2004. I'd, I played for like 10 minutes and thought... Nah, this is boring. Well, Philip's our single player guy, right? So, and he runs Planet Philip, which is a single player website. So I can understand that. I've kind of got into the single player aspect of gaming now because I don't really have time for multiplayer. Plus, the community is just retards now. I just hate uh, like the Halo community. That's maybe that's why he's so polite and, and kind is because he hasn't been tarnished by the uh, the fifteen year old know nothings who who just flood multiplayer servers and just call everyone names and generally hate life. Yeah, it could be, but gaming for me is is different. For me, it's an extension. It's the next stage or the evolution of storytelling because as I've written many times before, you had pictures on cave walls and then you had basic language and then you had printing and then you had radio and then you have television and for me computer gaming is the evolution of that because it gives us the first for the first time the actual chance to interact with our story and that's why I like single player games because I want to be the hero and I want to be the center of a story I don't just want to shoot people well that brings up another question I had a friend that I um, argued this with are video games art this is a little bit philosophical for the beginning of the show, but 
if you if you think that that's the next progression in, in in media, don't you think that we should be able to call Assassin's Creed or Half Life Episode Three art? You know, Absolutely. coming from an art, I don't have a problem. Yeah, I have no problem with that either. Coming from an art background, I have a minor in visual arts, and I specialize in interactive art. And I've done um, many art installations using even the Half-Life engine. Most recently, I recreated our entire art building in um, the Gold Source engine, and people could walk around. I hooked yeah. up a treadmill to the PC, and I had a little joystick there, and they could literally walk through the entire interactive piece, and that was considered art. So I don't know why video games can't be considered art. Well, there's this really big wig, highbrow kind of, you know, the type, the people who wear nothing but black and think that they're really intelligent, the pseudo intellectuals. Anyways, he said, I don't know, I don't know exactly who I'm quoting from, but he said that art cannot have a function other than itself. In other words, a car couldn't be art or a video game because it serves multiple functions. But I think that's stupid because there's the plenty of art that has function. I don't care who he is. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the guy's an idiot. I totally agree. I mean, that's just, that's just, as you say, highbrow. I mean, art can be functional, and perhaps that's one of the essences of really good art, is that it is functional as, w as well. I don't know, maybe that's too metaphysical now. Yeah, well, yeah. But, I mean, I think that was more of uh, someone who is 80 years old and can't get over, over the fact that you can still send email over this electronic box. Like, that blows him away, <laughs> so. I'm sure that he, he wants to stick with paint and... and easels, but honestly, I think that, I mean, technology is, is going to bring it all together. I mean, who's not to say that art won't be digital in 30, 50 or 6 years? I mean, hell, uh, my friend can look at porn on his iPhone at any given moment, at any point in the day, at a meeting, in the bathroom, doesn't matter. And if you can do that, I think that art can be even easier to make and even better in the next 10 years, maybe 50. You know, through my experience, though, art already is digital. It's not a matter of when it'll become digital. There's tons of digital streams of art. From my experience, though, and from my education, and from what I've learned, is art is anything that stirs emotion. Um, whether or not you're painting a picture, or you're painting something for others to look at, whether you're painting something that means something to you, or you're painting something with meaning, it's either way, it's going to stir up some sort of emotion. And anything that invokes emotion, to me, is considered art. And... Like I said, that's not coming from the that's coming from a university that teaches art. So whether or not that's an elitist attitude is a totally different story. But I think the elitists out there now are trying to keep art to themselves so that they so that not everybody can say, Oh, I can do art, so I'm an artist and then so they are, therefore they are considered less. But I think video games is definitely art. Yeah, well yeah, I think absolutely. um uh, Philip's giving me the uh, the hook thing. He's, he's threatening to stab me in the face if we don't get this back on track. So I think we should let him continue. No, no. Because we could be here all day. I agree with you both. I agree with you both. But I think the thing we need to remember is that we are part of this community. And a lot of these people who are saying that gaming isn't art aren't part of the community. And it happens on Planet Philip where people come in, they post for the first time, and they say something, this is rubbish. But they've never played the game. They don't understand the context, and they don't understand anything about it. And I think if you asked anybody connected with the gaming community, is it art? They will all say mm. yes. Absolutely. Actually, that's a good way of putting it, because I, would, I wouldn't ask a bum on the street or my cat for advice on astronomical physics or chemistry. And how would you expect some fat, old, useless man with a beard to tell me that video games can't be art just because he works in an art gallery? I think that, that art can be whatever we want. My foot, this keyboard... Or this podcast. You know what? This podcast is art. We're making art. You know what we are? We are artists. How does it feel to be artists? <laughs> I feel so, great. Okay, William. Okay, William. Tell us about the uh, the competition for the name of the uh, podcast. Right. Um, we kind of already went over it, but like I said, Ian won it. Uh, Ian from, I don't know what, I think he's from Planet Half-Life. Isn't he, No PK? Uh, I cannot confirm or deny that, and I cannot confirm or deny the <clears throat> possible um, skewing of the results or anything like that. Anyways, yeah, he might work at Planet Half-Life, which is, what's his game name? There was no skewing of the results, so we had an open poll and people decided between about that beer and the podcast. We, there, there is no chance that we didn't reroute one of the articles to vote yes for that poll. Absolutely no chance. That's why it wasn't 150,000 to one. 
<laughs> what, 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 what was his game name again? I mean, his actual like, I think it was game name. M81 Sniper, I think. Really? No one's on our I don't think he's. I don't think he's from PHL, huh? Yeah, I, think he's, I don't think he's, he's from a, PHL. He's a Planet Philip regular, but I don't think he's from specifically from PHL. Okay, maybe I just had him confused with somebody else. But either way, Ian won the contest, and Podcast 17 is our name. We mentioned it last week about what Podcast 17 means to us, and it's more of a rebellious underground, and as you can tell, our intro and outros reflect that. Um, we're going to try to keep this uh, a little bit themed. Um, obviously, it's hard to keep that theme going, but we are going to try to roll with it. Can I just say that uh, between the two names, I think Podcast 17 was 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 a, was a better idea, even though about that beer was sounded you know cool, but I think Podcast 17 was more centered around the actual you know theme of the show. And if you, you had had it about that beer, you would have a bunch of people who don't really care about Half Life downloading the podcast and really being really confused when they heard us talking about Gordon Freeman hitting things with a crowbar. Right. right. Yeah. My favorite was uh, Run Shoot Live Cast. Wow. See, I just didn't. I just didn't feel that. I didn't even. Uh, that was your favorite, and unfortunately, I had to disagree with that. And uh, only because I didn't even know that was the tagline of the original Half Life when it came out. And you call really? yourself a Half Life historian? Shame on you. <laughs> sorry. I, yeah, sorry, but I... you haven't played Counter Strike, the crucial element here to being a lonely gamer. I mean, come on. Yeah, but Counter Strike has got nothing to do with Half Life. Yeah, but but you have to admit, if it wasn't for Counter Strike, there wouldn't have been so many people that played Half Life. It was kind of the that's true. gateway drug. That Ooh, is true. That's a good point. Maybe we need to uh, explore that in another um, in another show. So, as my role mm. of you know stopping all these conversations, I'm going to get us back on track. And William, you're going to talk about the week's Half Life news. That's right. Um, oh the... boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! <laughs> the news hasn't been that crazy, other than of course all the media is geared towards Left 4 Dead, of course, coming out very soon. Um, there have been the achievements released, and usually I don't care about this sort of thing. I am kind of an achievement junkie because it adds a different aspect of gameplay. But you can check out the achievements. Uh, we'll link it in the list of links on this podcast. But it gives you an idea. It's actually a French site. It gives you an idea what the game's going to be about. So, I think there's one achievement where you have to kill, like, 53,000 zombies. And there's some other here, some some others here that give some theme to the game. So, it gives you an idea of how you're going to be playing with your friends. It's kind of cool there, to go there, through this list. It's called Zombie Genocidus. Kill 5,000, no, 50,000, no, 53,595 infected. And there's a reference for that, but I don't know what it is because I probably fail at culture and Half-Life, so... If, what 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 is that? What is that? What is the reference there? To be honest, I'm not even sure. I I figured it was a reference, but uh, maybe our producer Nick, who I like to call Nickopedia sometimes, can go look that up. Nice, Nickopedia. That's good. He's uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, the robot. We're talking about the one that's a robot, right? No, it's five right, three nine. No, five three five nine five. Right, 53595. Five, five. But there's some other achievements here, like uh, Spinal Tap, Kill an Infected uh, with a single blow from behind, and it gives you an idea that Infected can be killed from behind with a single yeah. blow. So it's kind of cool. I'm a bit disappointed. I mean, after seeing the stuff they've done for TF2, there's some really funny ones, like Have a Light or um, the Dragon Ball Z reference for the Pyro. I thought that was so freaking cool. I mean, there's uh, maybe they'll release new ones, but who knows? This is Valve, so... Oh, we just got it in. Nicopedia came in with an answer. It's a Dead Rising uh, reference, where in Dead Rising you're required to kill 53,594 zombies for one of their achievements, and Valve wanted to do them one better. So, <laughs> they're yeah, kinda, that's pretty they bumped good. it up by one, by one point, and that's awesome, actually. In Dead Rising 2, it should be five, uh, 53,596, and then they can just go back and forth. I want us to do 53,597 podcasts then. Mm. How many, how many weeks hard. or years is that? We can do, we can do 53,595 seconds of a podcast. Ooh, there sure. we go. Yeah, we can maybe, do that. maybe on that very second, we can say that we've reached our achievement. So, okay. that's the first news like story. Nick's going to need to, 
Listen, I just did the math. It would only take uh, 900 minutes or, uh, or 14 hours. 14 and a half hours. That's not bad. Yeah, that's about 14 yeah, we'll take podcasts. No we, can do- we can do it in one day. <laughs> Moving on along in the uh, news, there's another Left 4 Dead news thing that I found really cool because it's hard to get games in the media, but there's a Left 4 Dead trailer that reached Times Square. You can check out the video. It'll be, once again, on the links next to this podcast on podcast17.com. And uh, you can take a look at this. Obviously, there's no sound, because how can you have sound in Times Square? Although that might be really cool, having zombies Close scream captions. in Times Square. <laughs> but it is there, and it's such a cool PR stunt. Um, I heard Valve is oh. doing crazy PR for this game. Oh, Which yeah, did you hear that they said, I, now don't get mad at me for getting the number wrong, but it's either 7 or 9 million. They're dropping 7 or 9 million dollars on advertising for this game. And you have to say, they picked the perfect year, they picked the perfect, I mean, season. I mean, obviously this is the, the gaming season, this is when all the stuff comes out, but this, there's nothing to compete with it. There's nothing, first of all, there's no multiplayer co-op zombie experience like this, but also there's not... I mean, besides Dead Space, there's nothing really horror or gross coming out in, in the next few months. So this is the perfect time to drop it. This is the perfect genre. I mean, they hit it right on the nail. And I'd be super surprised if this didn't get uh, one of the best-selling games of the year or something like that. I mean, really, they are on it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And the reason why this is so important, not only because Left 4 Dead is coming out, but it's also important because as soon as Left 4 Dead's out and the tide has kind of settled... Then we're gonna. I think we're gonna start hearing things about Half Life Two Episode Three because then Valve oh. will start pointing their gears towards that. Oh, I hope. Do you, have, do you have any idea what it's been like to go a year and a half now with no release of news on the upcoming sequels that plan a Half Life? We have to write penis jokes all day. It's so it's getting boring. We need something. Just please, Valve, give us something to write about, please. My my children <laughs> need it. And and more importantly, once they do that. Well, more actually, even more important than that is once they uh, drop Left 4 Dead, that's going to pull in a whole nother just genre of people who didn't know about Half Life, who didn't know about Counter Strike, and then just suck them in and, and just kind of hopefully nab them and pull them into the into the community. I think that's true of all games that Valve release, though, because I'm sure that many readers for Planet Philip have never played the first Half Life game because the gaming community is essentially quite young. And as a new game is released, especially from Valve, because it takes a while, you get a bunch of new players, or the market has expanded, and then people sort of backtrack on the other games. So I think Absolutely. that's true of all. Yeah, yeah that happened sure. with TF2. I mean, I've I've got half the half the real life friends that I have that like Half Life now, like it because of of TF2 and and the modding community and things like that. And you can tell, too. You can tell when a new game comes out and then you see a plethora of add-ons and mods and concepts that are released on, say, ModDB or other community sites. And you can see that explosion after a new Valve is, game is released. And it's awesome. It's, it's just like um, a, a new mod coming out with an update. You get that plethora of people playing in the servers because it's fresh and it's new. And I just love that. And I can't wait. And it's a good period for us, too, us as a podcast. Because we're ready to take in all those listeners. We're ready to feed you information. So Yeah, exactly. Um, we'll um, have to cover that. Anyway, so that right. covers Left 4 Dead stuff. Up next is Half Secret. Uh, no PK or Emmanuel has already mentioned this, but we're going to talk Ooh. about it in a little bit more detail. Half Secret was released. Mm. I first saw it on City17.ru, yeah. and now it's on Planet Philip. So, Philip. What is it about? Well, um, basically you start the uh, mod, like Emmanuel said, in a very similar way to Half-Life. You're on the, the tram, there's uh, an accident, it doesn't work. You seem to almost be dead, but you're back alive. And then basically you work your way through playing through some of the uh, scenes from Black Mesa. I found the mod to be uh, in three parts, really. The first part was very plain, and you could almost run through it without actually attacking any any of the enemies or looking at any of the scenery. The second part was very uh, grunt orientated. There were lots of grunts, and I felt the third part was very backtracking, going backwards and forwards, or not so much backtracking, but very repetitious. 
So there were three basic themes to that mod when I played it. Right, and I wrote a review on Planet Philip about it, and stemming off of those mm -hmm. three three feelings of the game, I guess, there's also three general themes. You start off in a sort of storage warehouse, so to speak, and that's when um, kind of all the problems in the Residence Cascade hits the fan, and you have to make your way through the storage facility, and then you get into this, um, I guess, science lab, where you see all the Zen creatures that weren't in Half-Life 1. The reason I found this game, this mod, I guess, to be interesting is because the developer obviously took models and um, ideas from Half-Life 1 that weren't used in the original game and implemented them in this game. You see it sometimes in other mods, but really um, he concentrated on this in this mod alone. And then in the third final installment, um, you're thrown into the tunnels and you try to have to escape. But with that said, I just want to mention something real quick. It almost seems rushed. Um, within the first five minutes of the game, you experience everything Gordon Freeman experiences in a time span of, say, the first three hours of Half-Life 1. Yeah. So, the game seems condensed. Uh, it might be, it might have been a good idea to just concentrate on one specific aspect. So maybe he just concentrated on the science facility, because in my opinion, that was the best part of that mod, is running through that science facility. I don't know about you guys. But maybe if he just concentrated on that, and maybe it was just a different um, a different stem of the Half-Life series. Oh, I would have I would have loved to play the mod, but the second I saw the tram, and after the third minute of just sitting there on the tram again, like I've done in every other mod, I was just, I couldn't take it. I've just, I can't do it. I've done that 50,000 times. I can't do it again. I literally ripped the hard drive out of the computer, filled it with anthrax, and mailed it to the developer. I am sick of this. Why do they have to do that? I've done that a billion times. It's not new. Yes, it's immersive, but please stop it. I can't take it anymore. Well, I think it's something familiar, though, too. We were talking about the tram earlier, and the tram is something familiar to all Half-Life players. And it, it is kind of a good starting zone, because Black Mesa is obviously built on a complicated tram system. I don't want to get too much into the lore of the series, but the trams are everywhere, and obviously people take the tram. Well, but there, don't you think there should be a button, like, speed this sucker up, or skip the boring part, like like F5 or something? I mean, I would really appreciate that. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I, I liked the tram ride on this particular case, because if you'd have played the rest of the mod, you'd have seen that all the places that you visited through the tram ride, you actually visited when you played the mod. And I do understand oh. your point of view, that you've seen it, you know, you've seen that kind of thing plenty of times before. Mm -hmm. But perhaps the developer could have had somewhere where you can, just like a shift key, where you just jump yeah. straight to the playing part. Well, that's just me nitpicking. Though. I mean, I, I, I was kind of kidding. I did play the mod, but it's just... The tram is just... I know it's familiar. It's just kind of like last week when you guys commented on uh, Heart of Evil and how it doesn't have an autosave. I would love the ability when you click a new game if it said new game with tram or new game without tram. That would make my life just so much happier. I mean, even then, I don't really care that much, but I think it'd be really funny. I'd like to see a mod developer do that. Yeah, I could just do the map name thing, but... Just as a clarification point, that was Mistake, not Heart of Evil. What? Really? <laughs> we'll be talking about Heart of Evil later on, but wait, what? It was what? It was what? I thought it was Heart of Evil. No, we were talking about Mistake and how Mistake didn't have auto saves, and my game kept up crashing. Oh well, Heart of Evil doesn't either, and I played it for an hour in that one level because Heart of Evil does this no level loading thing, and you have to do objectives, and it's really actually pretty cool. But right before I finished, I died, and there was no auto save because there's not multiple levels, and. uh... I also threw my other hard drive out of the window out of frustration, so I'm running low on hard drives, so if anyone's got extra ones, you know, please get in touch. <laughs> I think it's a, an interesting point. I, I, hate, I hate to plug PP, but I, I wrote an article on PP many, many years ago, which was, can I skip the driving parts? And it was uh, inspiration from an article on uh, another website, which was, can I skip the boring parts? And basically, I suggested in a similar vein to your jumping the, the tram ride, that I hated driving the buggy for so much in Half-Life 2. And if I'd have had the option of pressing a button to jump onto the next stage... Really? That I would have taken that. Yeah, I would have done at the time. Oh, man. 
Oh, it's a good thing that we have such conflicting views because then we're never going to agree on mods. I thought that, like, oh, the, remember the tech demo at E3 when they showed the 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 guy uh, going in the car driving through that um, level where you have to run over the combine and then jump out and use a rocket launcher to kill the flying thing. I thought that was so freaking cool. And in the game, I had so much fun doing that. One of my favorite parts of the whole experience was just driving along the European coast, blowing stuff up and having a gay old time. I thought it was great. And if I had it my way, well, ID is actually doing that next year with a game called Rage, but I wish they would do more of it. And I was kind of disappointed that in episode one they didn't have more of it. But they didn't too, so I guess it's all right. I actually like the driving parts too. But you can skip it, essentially. You can skip chapters, which is what they did in Half-Life 2 when they released it. They added that yeah. chapter feature. But keep in mind, also, I mean... When other game developers, they throw something in, and mod developers are really guilty of this, they'll half-ass it. They'll they'll throw in, like, a driving part or some stupid helicopter part, and it is so badly coded in. It, it's buggy, it doesn't work well, the physics are terrible. Whereas in Half-Life 2, your your head's bouncing around, the gun on the, gu- the, on the car actually works, the, the, and you don't feel like... It was put in because they wanted to or because they had to. It feels like it's an actual fluid experience that they were creating. They didn't just think of it at the last second and throw it in. It's actually the game's crafted around the whole experience. I have two, I have two things to add. I, I do see what you're saying, but the problem with the uh, chapters part in uh, Half-Life 2 is you don't know where they start and end. So if you sort of jump in the buggy... Agreed. And, oh, crap. Yeah, you know, okay. I really don't want to do this you don't know Absolutely. how far you're going to miss the second point is talking about you know developers putting in uh you know vehicles or helicopters or something is that it goes back to the idea of this the half secret mod is that you either have two extremes with too many mods you either have a developer who only uses one set of environment and you know does it to death and it's boring and he doesn't do it very well or she doesn't do it very well or the other extreme where they try to add a bit of everything and that doesn't work either. And I get the feeling that the developer of Half Secret wanted this flow, but really didn't have enough time to do it properly and just sort of added as much as he could in a smaller space as possible. Right. Clearly, clearly there was a, a direct intent with Half Secret. And I actually really enjoyed the mod. I played it on hard, and I'm going to encourage you all to play it on hard. Because Don't it listen is kind to of him. Short He's game. lying. I played it on <laughs> medium, and I hated my soul. I hated every fiber of my being for not being a good enough man to beat that game on medium. It was so difficult. Maybe it's because I've been playing too many MMOs and racing games, but I've... God, I've never had a mod made me feel so dim-witted and slow. I really thought that I I was dumbing down. Okay, I agree with William. Play it on hard, and not only will you have the, you know, the joy of beating it on hard, you'll also have the feeling of superiority over Emmanuel when you've finished. Exactly, and you'll wake up the next morning with a side effect of hair all over your body because you'll be such a burly man that uh, you, no one will be able to handle you. You can walk into a bar, pick the fight with the biggest guy and tell him, I played Half Secret on hard. What the hell is up? You want to mess with me? And he will actually, run away and fair. Actually, I have a personal triumph. Uh, I, I wasn't going to mention it. I wasn't going to mention it, but I beat... Half-Life 1 on hard in one sitting yesterday from 2 p.m. to 3 a.m. Is that what you were doing? I saw you playing Half-Life, and I was thinking that he can't really be playing Half-Life for that long. I thought you just opened up Half-Life and let it running, left it running or a mod or something, but really? Yeah, dude, I didn't stop. It was crazy. I'm going to play next up on my list is Blue Shift hard, one sitting. Oh, Blue Shift I hated. I, Opposing Force is my favorite out of all of them, but... I mean, what what you have to do is every time an episode comes out, I did it for episode one and episode two, and I, I remember you mentioning this. You have to go back, start with Half Life, play through every one of them from scratch, and then uh, and then you get to play episode two or three or whatever comes out. That's what you do. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I, I really want to play all the mods that come out on Planet Philip and in the community on Hard now because Actually, I really do think don't... it extends the gameplay. Actually, I'm surprised you guys haven't mentioned this. A mod came out called Half-Life Decay. And this is not just a mod, but this is incredibly crucial because a lot of people like me, and I'm guessing you guys too, we want to catch up on the whole Half-Life experience, the official Valve Half-Life experience of what they released. And they released something on the PS2 called Half-Life. I think it was Decay. I think that was the same name. And it was like a co-op Half-Life exper- uh, a mod. Not a mod, but a game. They released it as that. And it's so hard to come by. And then these guys come out of nowhere and are like, 
oh hey by the way we completely recreated the experience and uh and single player uh, for the PC, and you guys can go ahead and play that if you missed it. And it co completely went under everyone's radar, and I'm really disappointed about that. Well, no, no, no. Actually, I did play it, and somebody on the Podcast 17 uh, Podcast 17 comment section said that we forgot to mention it. We didn't really forget to mention it. We just had so much to talk about. We can talk about Decay right now. It was amazing. I've always wanted yeah. to play oh, that yeah. version. And and how many times do you get to sit down with a, a best friend or someone you hate and play the game with them like that? Like, that is not something you get done very often. And, and even then, in the for instance synergy where it's still kind of buggy and hard to get get working, you know, it's it's hard to do properly. And they did it. They really did it. I mean, besides one or two show stopping bugs, we had a great time with it. Really well done. Well, I'm a big Sven Co-op fan and still am today. I host. 12 Sven Co-op servers from my house and I was I pretty much had a mini orgasm when Decay came out and Decay does things in, in terms of the co-op experience that a lot of Sven Co-op maps, for all you Sven Co-op listeners out there, a lot of Sven Co-op maps still don't do today so I think even the community can learn from a mod like this and for, oh, yeah. for people to take this game and port it to PC is just an amazing endeavor, and I totally co commend the the developers of Decay for this, because it was definitely something that ne that was needed. Playing as Gina and oh, what's her name? What's the other girl's name? Oh, I can't remember her name. Anyway, um, playing as Gina <laughs> and the other chick um, is just really tied everything together. I mean, you deliver the sample at the v very beginning of the game, and you're like, oh, so that's who delivers the sample, and that's who turns I on the particle uh, analyzer. I, w I wonder why they named one of them Gina. Anyways, th th you're right though. It's like they were locked away, these, p these mod developers were locked away in a room away from the mod community and had exceptional talent in doing what they do and then just decided to bang out a mod. And then they came out with something that, I mean, really, it, I'm not trying to toot its horn too much, but I wish more mod developers would follow this kind of paradigm of, of releasing stuff that's quality, but not spending years doing it. I mean, God, it was just some, it's so, so, it's just so good to see something polished like that, but not take eight years to release. Resistance and Liberation did this too, and, and they, they almost did the way, they almost went way of um, taking forever to release it, and then, you know, not releasing it because it wasn't up to par, uh, up to par, but really they they just took the time polished what they had and then released it you can tell that they definitely had to cut stuff out of decay because it is a little bland in some areas but my god is it good i think i think they did a fantastic job i think they took a little i think they took a while because my understanding is that they did start that mod and then it got abandoned and then they started it again but my problem was that i got bored after about 20 minutes of having to switch characters and i know you guys are going to like trash me for that but I think it would have been fantastic if I'd have played it single oh. player. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. But but you see, you don't like multiplayer games, so we. I mean, I'm not going to comment on on how you're wrong for that and how you're a bad person and no one's ever going to love you. But I will say that you really should play it with me or or William because it really is a good experience and it's just it needs to be played multiplayer. And although it would have been cool if they had like a bot run with you, I think that. They spent so much time perfecting what they already had. I mean, from a development point of view, it would have been a nightmare to try to get that uh, implemented as well. Think of it from Do the flip understand? side, though. Uh, sorry, think of it from the flip side. Most developers nowadays wouldn't have even put in that functionality of switching characters. They would have exactly. just said, "They would have just said, this is a multiplayer mod. You can't, you can't play it single player." But you know what? The people at Decay did that. They said, here, we're going to add this Switch functionality so that we can open it up to the single-player community. And that was a big thing. Imagine how much work that was to do. Philip, did you ever play Sven Co-op? No. You should mute the voice, rec uh, voice record and go into a server and play uh, Sven Co-op with, uh, with William because it plays so much like a single-player experience that's progressive. I think you'd really like it. Yeah, I yeah, think maybe. you would too. I mean... I, I, I don't have a problem with the, you know, multiplayer per se, as long as the, there's a, a reason for me playing. And I've just never really had any friends on the internet, so there's nobody really I could play with. But, you know, I, I'm open to that suggestion. We'll be a friend. I, I'll, I'd, I'd love to be a friend. How about you, William? We can be his friend. Me too. 
Maybe we could have a listener Sven co-op match to get oh, no. Philip into into Sven co-op. No, no, let's have a contest. Be be uh, Philip's friend, and then we'll have a poll, and whoever wins can be his friend, and we'll pay them to be his friend. Otherwise, you can just settle for us. I mean, I I can't promise I'll be a good friend to you, but I might play Sven co-op with you. That's very kind of you guys. In fact, I think I'd rather have zombies as friends. And talking of zombies, William, tell us about this new Oh, movie. nice really link. Look movie. at that link. Yeah. Yeah, he nice is on segue. there. <laughs> yeah. Today, actually, we haven't played it yet, but we wanted to mention it, only because um, the podcast is released on Monday, so you've probably already played it, the listeners. A new mod was released on ModDB. I just found this by chance. It's called OMFG Zombies LOL. And it's a mod, I guess, um, I'm just going to quote him, quote them straight from here because I haven't played it yet and I don't think any of us have. Um, After two weeks of coding and trying to refine stuff, taking a map from stock HL2DM and making it bot capable, trying to refine the barricade code as much as possible, OMFG Zombies LOL is out. The objective of this mod is simple, stay alive. Players will fight to survive against waves of new zombie types as well as the classic old ones. Some new zombies include suicide bo- bomber zombie, exploding head crabs, flaming zombies. The player gains a point from killing zombies and can use them to buy new weapons and more ammo. I only have one map because I didn't spend any time making a real one. Oh, well, that sounds promising. For this was only a learning project for me and you get the source and you get the source code that comes with it. So grab the client files and go killing some zombies. So the okay. mod is pretty basic. I just have to say, there was a mod for this, uh, like this, for Unreal Tournament, and it was a bunch of fun. I think there's even a gameplay mode, too, that I I remember playing with a friend. And the premise is really good, and if he follows through and actually does this mod properly, I will actually be looking forward to playing it. Right now it's more of a joke, but I have to say, any of you with uh, uh, with a... with a fan disposition to Half-Life, full life consequences, you will really, really, really like this. Because that definitely makes a debut. Yeah, I think the game has potential. Obviously, it is a joke right now, and there's not a lot of people taking it seriously, although we're not taking it seriously either. Um, But, you know, just if you want to just go into some sort of horde single-player game, you can just go in and you load this up and you just beat on zombies for however long you can survive. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's that's exactly it, and uh, really, I think so much of the mod community is worried about a doctrined experience. Uh, for example, you'll see mods that heavily worry; they try and follow the Valve standard of of gameplay of meticulously p- placing NPCs and making sure that everything works perfectly. Whereas, it's I mean, it's just fun to get out and just shoot stuff. It's that's that's partly the lure for me of playing multiplayer games that I don't have to think; I can just point and click. I think this is yeah. good. Philip, how does this mod look to you? <clears throat> oh God, here we go. I don't think he's gonna like it at all. That's just my guess. Philip, go ahead. Uh, I don't know. It's probably one of the ones that I'd I'd miss simply because uh, I like the thoughtful, slow, considered approach. I just want to play something with a story. Having said that, there's a couple of mods that I featured on Planet Philip called Zay 1, 2, 3, and 4, and this was basically you just go in and you shoot zombies, and you go around, you go to another room, and you shoot shoot zombies. So the idea is fine. It's the implementation that matters. I will definitely try it, but I can't you know, promise I'll love it. Yeah, I was going to say, see, I have this bad habit of liking bad games, so I'm, if, you, if I like it, you guys probably should not play it. And uh, I'm going to go out and say that I'm probably going to love this, so avoid it. But I would listen to Planet, uh, I mean, I would listen to Philip here, because he's right. It's, it, it is a little silly at the moment. But I mean, also keep in mind, it's like, what, 15 megabytes, and if you've got 20 minutes to kill, or you want to procrastinate doing homework or going to work or something, what better way to do it? Um, Absolutely, but... I, I've got to I've got to agree with you on that. I think that we should play everything. I know I'm guilty of not doing oh, that, yeah. but basically we should play everything because you never know what you're going to like until you play it. Exactly. exactly. I mean, uh, if if you go if you're going to the mall or something, and at every corner someone's giving you free food, do you mm-hmm. go, oh no, I can't do that because I'm too busy, or do you just take it and try it out? I mean, you have free stuff here. Why not try it out? And that if you guys don't mind, is a segue into my question, which I would like to say, 
Wait, is it? Is that? No, it isn't. Never mind. All right, go ahead. That's not next on the list. Next on the yeah, list, it's though. Yeah, next on the list. <laughs> next on the list, though, we have an interview with Strider Mountain. Um, it's pre-recorded. We recorded it literally 30 minutes ago. So we're just going to cut it in there, uh, and you guys can take a listen. It's really interesting interview with uh, TB and Spy. TB is the PR guy, and Spy is the lead mapper of Strider Mountain. And you can hear all about it right now. And with us today, we have uh, members of the Strider Mountain team. Welcome, TB and Spy. Welcome, guys. You guys? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, I'm TB Biggs. I'm marketing for Strider Mountain, and Leon is our mapper. Thanks for inviting us. Glad to be here. No yeah, problem. Be, uh, glad to be here. Everybody is thinking and talking and wondering about Strider Mountain, so why don't you tell us a little bit about it before we ask the ultimate question later on? Right. Okay. I'll take that question. Strider Mountain. It's uh, you know it's hard to believe it's been in development now for nearly two years. And uh, the members that uh, are not on the uh, broadcast today are Baltic Forever, our project lead and just uh, a technical wizard, and Cube Dude 89 who's our modeler, just uh, another incredibly talented young man. And then uh, we have some original music in the mod that was done by David Mason uh, at uh, stainofmind.com, just a really talented team. So, yeah, it's been in development for two years. We're really excited about it. It's, um, if you've been following it all, we're up to 14 maps now. And um, it's just going to be a wonderful journey up a mountainside, and and what fa what's up at the top of that mountain will will hopefully surprise everybody. Spy, you want to add anything to that? Well, not much, but I maybe I can explain why we made this uh, second big uh, mod with Half Life 2 before we made Coastline to Atmosphere, and that was an also 14 maps uh, single player mod, and after that. Because that was so much work, we said to ourselves, well, we do it never again, at least not with Half-Life 2, because we already made before uh, Coastline to Atmosphere another 4 SP map pack. So we just want to make a short mod, but, well, it gr did grow over months, and now, like TB said, uh, it ended with 14 maps. What do you think is the, uh, the game time? How long will it take people to, um, to play this mod? Yeah, that's that's a good question. You know, certainly it depends on your skill level. I uh, I would imagine it would take, um, I would say about five to eight hours. Spy, would you agree with that? Well, it's hard to say. Some people run through maps, and other people are very slow in maps. Like myself, I like to experience everything. But about coastline to atmosphere, I I hear that uh, most people played about nine hours when they played. Uh, not slow, but normal, you could say. And I think that, you know, yeah, this map uh, mod will also take about nine hours, I think, when you play just normal. You know, and the wonderful thing that about if, if you've played any of uh, Leon's Spies maps, uh, Coastline Atmosphere, or any of his other mods, is he makes huge maps. And um, uh, so, yeah, the, there's certainly people that run through them, but... Um, uh, the maps, are, the maps are huge, and there's a lot to play in the map. And so, if you multiply that by 14, it's 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 a big game. Yeah, I mean, there have been a few mods that were released with 14 levels or more. But you're right, spies spies uh, levels are bigger than most. So so you know, it's the time that's uh, interesting for most people. One of the questions I received uh, about. Uh, coastline to atmosphere was that it was pretty hardcore there were certain sections where there were a lot of enemies is strider mountain going to be the same uh, maybe i can this answer this question uh, it's 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 really silly when you know why uh, coastline to atmosphere was that hard it i'm i'm a bit ashamed to say the reason but well it's true it's it's too silly for word but when i made uh, coastline to atmosphere i had set my off or my Half-Life uh, 2 game was set default on uh, the difficulty settings easy and I didn't know that so I was mapping and I was always thinking it's very easy so you have to add more soldiers or combines in this case and to add more and to make it harder and only when I was about with the, with the 10 or 11 map so at the end of the mod then I noticed that I was always mapping on easy 
And when you played it all normal, then it was suddenly f maybe too hard for most people. But then I couldn't go back. So that's why we also said when you start uh, Coastline to Atmosphere, then you see an announcement that it's uh, meant to be played on easy. And that's the reason why Coastline to Atmosphere was so hard. <laughs> that's okay. really interesting. I didn't realize. We're talking about maps and how maps are bigger or smaller than other maps, but then there's another complexity of maps, uh, linearity versus nonlinearity. I noticed on the Strider Mountain site that you guys kind of have a map, and it almost looks like you can choose different paths to get to the top of the mountain. Is this something you're incorporating in your maps to create a nonlinear environment? Maybe I'll let TB answer this one. Uh, yeah, William. No, the the you know it's one of those things where when you're when you're on a long journey, I think that we wanted to just show a picture of what that journey looks like. So, I wish we could have built it so that you could perhaps go um, on a different route. But no, that's really literally just a route map so that people have kind of like a uh, you know a view of what that of what the Strider Mountain journey looks like. Is there a lot of tracking there back of, through the map? Uh, no, no. I hate personally backing track. Uh, uh, going back to through maps, so I really try to avoid that. Maybe it will happen one, once or twice, but normally not. Uh, about uh, making maps uh, linear, I try to not to make them, and uh, more with this mod as in the uh, previous mod, I try to make landscapes more open so you could take a different road or route. But uh, the difficulty with that is then you have to make maps even larger and you have to build in paths that are not necessary but just are there so that the player could take another route and well I like to make the maps that big maybe I could explain that one also because when I play myself maps I like to have them big because especially with Half-Life 2 when you uh, load a map the first time the loading time is very large but after that when you get killed in a map the, the loading time is very short so when so when you make a large map, then you only have one time and long loading time, and the next times are short. And we have s uh, short maps, then you have each time a longer loading time. So that's why the maps are pretty big, or better said, they are as large as possible. It wasn't possible to make them any larger, because the editor couldn't handle that. Then there were all, all silly bugs appearing, so they are lar as large as possible. So on that same vein, then, would you say that uh, Strider Mountain incorporates more of an, an outdoor open landscape environment rather than an indoor complex type Black Mesa deal? It's 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 got both actually. So there's there's a whole lot of outdoor stuff, and then at some point you've got to go down into the mountain. So it's it's back indoors. So um, and then of course you got to get back out. So it's it's both. Um, wonderful indoor and outdoor maps. Yeah, when I map, uh, especially when it's a map epic or, mo or a mod, then personally I like to play uh, different maps. When I play, say, three maps, then I like to say to see that they're all different. When you have several maps and they all look the same, then you get very soon a more dull experience. So each map, when you play it, is, is different as the one before. Uh, even when they're outdoors or indoors. Okay, so before we get um, onto the question of the story, I have a question about the, the, the gameplay itself. Have you incorporated the altitude and the uh, temperature into the gameplay? For example, does the player actually get starved of oxygen and either need to go to an oxygen station or does the cold affect the health in any way? We kicked around that idea. I'm going to let Spy into this question, but certainly if you're at 30,000 feet or so, um, your oxygen levels would be thin, the, the ice, the cold, all that sort of stuff. And we definitely talked from a development standpoint about how to incorporate that into gameplay. And uh, it wasn't certainly as, as, it wasn't an easy task, but I'm going to let Spy into that question. Yeah, the problem was with this mod that. Uh, we didn't have a uh, an, coder on the team, so it wasn't possible for us to change really big things in Half-Life 2 itself, and therefore it wasn't possible to do something with the code. We talked about it very long uh, even, but and we, we would, would like to add something like that, but yeah, it was simply not possible because, because we didn't have a, had a coder. We do have a change in health packs in, in the beginning and in the end, 
Uh, there are normal health packs and health um, stations and those suit stations where you can uh, upload them. But later on on the mountain we change that in air bottles. So you have to take an air bottle when your help is low. So we could do that, but that was the most we could do without a coder. Now with that said as well, sorry, are you guys implementing obstacles then too? When you're climbing the mountain, I'm assuming it's going to be a difficult task. Um, are you going to have to do some jumping techniques, or will there be certain things you have to avoid, some crouching and some climbing and that sort of thing? Yes, there will be uh, some climbing and jumping, and there is an especially a part in the mod where you have to drive with the jeep, and also with the jeep you have to make a jump. Um, yeah, I like to make some kind of, especially because Half-Life is a game with, with puzzles and also climbing and crouching and that kind of puzzles you could say. So yeah, we, we try to put that also in it. We had a really interesting conversation one time about um, the team that is about uh, some of the gameplay in Strider Mountain. And, and we went back to our, our Halo days where we, we, we tend to, we love the ending of Halo where you had to drive like crazy to get off the... Uh, to get to get out of there so um that was kind of the inspiration to, as spy was saying uh, to driving the 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 buggy up and down the mountain and and that'll come into play so it's sort of halo-ish okay so tv tell us a little bit about the story involved right the story yeah it's it's basically there is it, it's interesting because it's called strider mountain so one would think that you're going to be battling striders all the way through this through the gameplay, and, and if you take a look at the screenshots, and I think we have somewhat of around 100 screenshots, and we have uh, three or four teaser videos, you see very few Striders, and there's there's a reason for that. It's called Strider Mountain, but the, the point is, is as, a, as the game, you have to destroy the source of the Striders. And so there's going to be some Striders in the game, certainly, but it's really, really a quest to destroy the source of the Striders. And therein lies some of the, the puzzle aspect to the game. So um, basically, at the top of the mountain, it's way up there, it's a couple miles high, there's there's something going on that's producing these Striders. And and you play Gordon Freeman, you got to go up this mountain. It's no easy task to go up this mountain. And you got to destroy the source of the Striders, and then, without giving away too much of the ending, you got to get back down. If you had to place your mod in a timeline of, say, Half Life, you said you play as Gordon Freeman. Would you say it comes before Half Life Episode Two or epi after Episode One? Where would it be in the timeline, or does it even matter on that vein? Uh, well, I I really wouldn't know. <laughs> Uh, people ask the same with uh, our last uh, mod, uh, Coastline to Atmosphere, and also with that one, I... Oh, no, 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 that's not true. That one was specially built after, you could say, the story after uh, Half-Life 2 itself. But with this one, well... Uh, I, no, I, I wouldn't know where you could place it in the storyline. Yeah, I don't think there is. I don't think it really matters. But somebody in one of the forums asked a really great question, and I wish we had thought of this. They said that in Episode 2, there's the Striders, and in the background you can see a big mountain. And they asked us if we knew um, that was going to be in the gameplay for Episode 2, and, and, and is that Strider Mountain? And boy, it would be great if we could have said, yeah, well, that, it certainly is, but, but it's not. So to answer your question, it's really, um, I, I'm not sure the timeline is really relevant. Okay, no, that makes that makes a big difference. So, okay, so every reader or listener, sorry, every listener will want us to ask this question: How long until the release? I cannot believe you asked that question, Philip. <laughs> the, the release, you know, we believe me. If there's if there's a, a group of guys that want to get something out more than anything, it's us. We've been working on this for for nearly two years and. To say you're working on something for two years has it, it, it's it's hard to really quantify that. I mean, it's been it's been amazing um, the time and effort and energy and and I always say that uh, that are that's put into it. And I always say that mods actually are free, but they cost the developers money. So you actually have to pay to make a mod, believe it or not. All right. So the release question: We're the maps. The 14 maps are done. We're about ready to release some screens on the very last map, which is called Exit Portal that adds a really nice twist and an ending to the mod. So 
Baltic is going through along with Spy and, and Cube Dude and, and doing some of the uh, fixing some of the bugs because you certainly want to release it as as bug free as possible. So all that being said, we are targeting uh, end of November, December for a time frame of release. Wonderful. So that's fairly soon. So people won't have to wait very long. No, finally, finally it will come out indeed, yes. <laughs> One thing before we cut the interview short um, that I wanted to touch on is, I, unfortunately Cube Dude, Dude isn't here right now, so maybe TB you can talk about some of the models and some of the uh, custom things that you have in the game outside of the map realm. Yeah, so I can answer this question too. I'll tell you, Cube Dude... Um, 89 his, his propensity to make models is unbelievable he is just so talented and and he is going to be in the gaming industry and and probably be a major player in the gaming industry um there's a custom buggy there's um uh it, it's interesting because some of the, some of the great i'll let spy answer that question about the models but some of the his best models actually didn't make it into game we originally had a camouflage truck as the vehicle and uh, uh, we thought we were pretty clever. We named the truck Redirts, which is Strider backwards, truck dirt. Hopefully there was some sort of connection there. Um, but try as we might, technically, we could not get the truck in game. So um, it, it's it's just too bad. Like I said, some of the models that he made are so good that didn't make it in game. But so yeah, Spy, why don't you answer that question about some of the models? Because you're the one that actually integrates them into the maps. Yeah, well, the problem with that car, I believe uh, Cook Dude worked for four months on it, and uh, it was indeed looking really realistic, uh, although the main problem was with it, that, and you, you couldn't know that up front, Cook Dude, was that uh, the vehicle wasn't uh, driven by the player from inside, so that you looked from behind the steering wheel, but the, the, view of the viewpoint of the player was be just behind the truck. And especially in, at the beginning of where you drive with a vehicle uh, through the ma through some maps, uh, you drive through very narrow streets. And when then you drove the truck uh, around the corner, your point of view was coming outside of the map. So your point of view did went through houses, so to say. Yeah, and that was not possible. So that's what was the main reason why we had to put the the custom-made car by Cool Dude down. It was a real shame because it would add a lot. I believe it's even the first time that a custom-made vehicle would add a mod uh, in Half-Life 2. And well, all the other mods uh, are, are great. I can't say much more about that. There are a lot of models in the, in the mod, so it, it makes it look more not half-life so to say that because everyone uses the normal models and that makes that every map starts to look uh, similar got a question about some maps but before i do that you just mentioned about the models um are you going to release the models to the community for them to use in other mods especially for example the uh, jeep that you didn't use in uh, strider mountain I, be I believe that Coop Dude uh, will upload them to some place where people can download them, but I'm not sure. I, I do believe he, talk he did talk about that. Uh, on the subject of modeling, it's um, certainly Cube Dude 89 is an amazing modeler, but let's not forget that Baltic has, has created some of the models for the game as well, including, um, you know, if you're going to have a, a source of Strider, so to speak, you're going to have to have some sort of machine that, that takes them apart and makes them. And so, um, a fantastic model that's in the game, and I think it's, if I'm not mistaken, if you look at the third trailer for Strider Mountain, it kind of hints at uh, the model that Baltic made, where it's, it's a machine that takes Strider parts and puts them together. It's absolutely fantastic. It's almost epic. It's really, really cool. Ooh, sounds interesting. So, I've heard uh, talk of a bonus map. What can you tell us about that? Is it like an Easter egg? Will you need to complete a special task or get somewhere or something? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Spy answer that question, but I will say that I, I'm, I'm a fan, and, and we had a lot of conversations about unlockable maps, unlockable content. Um, I'll answer that question a different way, Philip. I'm actually working on what I'm calling the making of a mod, because in, in two years of development, it, it, it's shocking almost how much doesn't get in-game and how many things go on that, that are never seen, so... Perhaps there's some interest in, in some of the, the behind the scenes, kind of like a, you know, a DVD, the developer's cut, where um, I have a, a making of the mod 
uh, thing that's going to show a, a lot of video and a lot of screens and things that never made it in game. But to, to answer the question about the unlockable map, we, we talked about it and we love the idea of having something, giving something to the player at the end. And and Spy was certainly the mastermind behind that. I'll give it to him. Um, I first want to say something different because uh, Baltic Forever is, his name is now mentioned as modeler, but his main task was throughout the whole mod was uh, when I didn't know how I could make something what, what often was the case then I had to ask him uh, how can you make that and he likes to figure out how you make things and then he told me and then I was able to make it that was his ta task uh, throughout the mod but now especially the last few months he is actually doing all the bug fixing and that is yeah, really an excellent do job and when he didn't do that well then simply the mod couldn't be released, I think. Uh, the most problems we had the last few months were that we used the episode 2 code. Maybe that's important to say that uh, this mod needs Half-Life 2 to be installed, but it will look like episode 2. So the blood and gore and special effects like fire and explosion, all kinds of things like that, will look like episode 2, what will look much better. Excellent. So what about the, what about the unlockable map that we were previously talking about because now I want to hear about this. Yes, sorry, sorry. Now I want to hear about this. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that. Uh, we talked about it because we or, or I have read uh, in a lot of places that people like uh, unlockable futures that they can do something where they can win something with. So we talked about that and then we needed, we thought, a counting mechanism because when you find an Easter egg or not, that has to be consequence for later on and so we had to find a, f uh, a system that counted the easter eggs that were uh, caught by the player so at the end if he could win then something we, we decided to make an extra map and that could be uh, won by the player by finding every easter egg because we couldn't uh, make a counting mechanism only we could say if all easter eggs were found or not. So we have placed in each map one easter egg, you could say. It's not a real easter egg, but it's actually, you have a laptop, and you have to uplo or, yeah, upload or some uh, download something, and you have to download in uh, 30 maps, so at the end you, c you win the extra map. Wow, that actually adds a very interesting level of replayability to your mod, which is what a lot of mods, I think, are lacking nowadays, is replayability. So that should be really interesting, especially for the hardcores who want to go back and play through the game and try to get everything done. Um, before we close up the interview, I just want to ask where can uh, where can listeners go and readers, so to speak, go to find out more about Strider Mountain, or what magazine can they pick up? <laughs> yeah, great question. We were well. First of all. Um... I'm I, I this is TV. I do all the the website development, so certainly you can go to stridermountain.com for the latest news, and uh, screens and and videos and final trailers and all that sort of stuff coming up. So thanks for asking that. But yeah, we were really really pleased and and kind of surprised that in the latest edition of PC Gamer, Strider Mountain was picked by Brett Todd, who's one of the um, one of the columnists. Sorry about that. And he uh, picked, so PC Gamer, the current edition, he picked Strider Mountain as mod of the month. That's very exciting. I did see the article Cube Dude, but Dude actually sent it to me. Um, that must be a great accomplishment for you guys, really boost some morale and get you guys uh, going in terms of excitement for the mod. Yeah, exactly. Again, you know, after after two years of development, you, you certainly can get to a point where, gosh, I just want to get this thing out. But uh, when you see something like that, you run out to the store and you buy three or four copies and you mail them to your friends, right? It's um, it's it's really lifted us uh, great, and we're just really honored to be picked. It's a, it's a, it's 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 fantastic. Was this the uh, American version of PC Gamer? I, I can only answer. Uh, I think so. Um, I'm not sure what the year. I'm not sure if there's a different European version. Spy, did you did you ever pick one up? I uh, I have to admit that I have looked for it, but I couldn't find it. I could find the PC Gamer of PC Gameplay, and that's a different magazine. And I thought first that that was the one. So I have to look still. But what I have thought of heard is that uh, Europe and England and America all have different magazines, so they have the same uh, name and cover, maybe. But the stories inside are written by their own 
people, so I don't think that. But I will check it if it's in there. It would be nice to if it, if it would be worldwide. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so if we don't have anything else, I just want to thank you guys for being on the show. I mean, it's been a definite pleasure to have you on the show here with us, and uh, we definitely look forward to Strider Mountain. Philip, do you have any closing words? Just to say thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it, and I'm sure all the listeners will play it and love it. And perhaps after we've had, uh, after it's been released, we can maybe have a short podcast review and maybe even get you back on the show uh, a, a month or so after it's released to you know talk about its reception and you know a few other things if that's cool. But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Well, it's just really exciting to be here at Podcast 17. I think this is just a, I'm, I'm going to be one of your regular listeners. I think it's just a fantastic thing that you're doing and for the community. And um, uh, on behalf of the guys who aren't here on, on the Strider Mountain team, we want to really say thank you and we appreciate it. Yes, I also want to thank you. It would be nice uh, when the others were there, but they couldn't. And uh, I also will be listening to, to this uh, channel because, yeah, I would like to hear also from other mothers. Well, thank you both for coming, and uh, sorry that Cube Dube and Baltic couldn't be with us. And that's the Strider Mounting interview. And welcome back from the interview. That was an exciting interview, wasn't it, Philip? Yeah. Uh, oh. I um, I really enjoyed getting a chance to talk to them because even though I've had a long association with Strider Mounting, some of the readers or listeners may know I was on the team right at the beginning. Um, I've never actually spoken to them. Everything's by been by emails or something. So it's nice to talk to them. Philip, don't hate me, but I've I haven't heard much about it. I mean, I would like to learn a lot more about it, and I think that uh, this interview was a great idea, and I can't wait to re-listen to it. Awesome. Yeah, I think a lot of listeners. I think the interview is going to open it open up the mod for a lot of listeners. Because to be honest, before Planet Philip, I haven't heard much about Strider Mountain either. But the mod looks awesome, and they are in PC Gamer as we discussed in the interview. So I mean, that's definitely counting for something. Isn't that awesome that PC Gamer will actually go through mods and all of that? I, I just I think that's so cool. Well, um, they realize there's a lot awesome of potential. That, isn't it awesome, or isn't it bad that they've taken this long to do it? That's Did they too. used to do it? I, I thought they featured like Insurgency about a year ago, and then they also featured... Well, maybe I might be thinking... Oh, no, that was a UK magazine, I'm sorry. I'm sure they did, Emmanuel, but the point is that I mean, the mod scene is such an integral part of the gaming scene that, you know, these, mo these magazines, it should be a significant part. Oh boy, oh boy, is that my segue to do my part? No. Oh boy, oh boy. No. No? Oh. No, not yet. All right. <laughs> but just real quick, um, our Blast from the Past segment is, I played Heart of Evil again, uh, I played through it, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about it and why it's an am amazing game, but yet very frustrating. <laughs> um, the game, of course, does follow... Uh, it doesn't follow Half-Life at all. It's just done on the Gold Source engine. Um, it follows a Vietnam storyline. If you've ever seen Apocalypse Now, the movie, it's pretty much the exact same thing, only with zombies. So, if you're into that sort of type of movie, you would definitely like this game. It's kind of a satirical comment on Vietnam and it has some funny moments but the idea is and no PK has already mentioned it a lot there's a lot of backtracking involved and the biggest down part is you have to walk through the entire game while dragging Barney with you he has to come from the beginning of the game <laughs> to the end of the game and it is can so I, hard can I just say that the, while that is true and the backtracking gets annoying there are there are portions of it where it makes sense. Um, backtracking when you're in the same level at that moment and you're just trying to complete an objective is great because it gives you familiarity. Um, the, if I'm right, the mobs respawn, right? And so you still are constantly facing action. That or it's really well just planned. Um, and, and that in that way, it is awesome. I mean, I love the fact that I can go back and I know what's going on. I, I've been in this area. I can kind of use it strategically. That's pretty cool. But as as uh, William said, it is pretty annoying walking at half speed trying to drag Barney along. It's really bad. Right, but I think a lot of mods can take a page from Heart of Evil's book. This is what I wanted to talk about. I didn't want to talk too much about Heart of Evil. We're going to hopefully try to get uh, Nathan on the show. Maybe. I'm still trying to contact him. But uh, I think what 
a lot of developers can take from this is that non-linearity is important to storyline. If you want to make an interesting story, create non-linearity in your mods. And if you're not if you not sure what that means, it's when you go through a game and you have multiple pathways to go through it. Or even backtracking is considered a form of non-linearity. You have to go back over certain areas and open up new doors. Uh, we mentioned this before. I don't. I can't remember when it came up, but when you give somebody a puzzle, uh, you don't want to give the person the puzzle and immediately give them the answer to said puzzle. You want to give a person a locked door and force upon them to recognize that there is a locked door and there's something behind that door. They have to go through the entire map and eventually come back to said locked door. That's always a. That's definitely a part of non-linearity, but. Heart of Evil takes it a step further, and you have to enter maps through different ways, and those states carry on through maps. It's really intricate. They've done a really good job. I wouldn't call that a... Well, see, that's that's the thing. I guess the definition of a puzzle to mod developers is playing fetch, and that bugs me because I've seen such good puzzles in God of War, and um, some of the Half-Life 2 portions are really good. But then, then you get parts where you have to get key. Now go get the other key and put this key with this key. Now combine the two. Now go to this door. Open this door. And that's just fetching for me. Um, I didn't get to play through the whole thing, so I'm not sure if, if they continue that or what. But um, they definitely... It wasn't the puzzles that got me. It was just the non, like you said, that kind of sandbox environment where you're not loading level to level to level in some parts. I actually spent a good 40 minutes in one map just backtracking back and forth, killing stuff, um, kind of completing objectives and... I have to say, in the source version of it that we're playing, it's pretty cool. I think they pulled it off pretty well, even though the models were made by someone who's 8 years old. I think it, the rest of it's really good. See, that's the reason why I played Heart of Evil, is because I'm prepping myself to pull, replay it in the source version, because I didn't know the source version existed until a couple of days ago. So I'm going to play through the source version and see how that sizes up. But I think Heart of Evil is interesting. It's fun. It's long. It's really, really long. And as Emmanuel said, you spend a time on a level for an extremely long time. I haven't, um, I haven't played this uh, mod in a very, very long time. I played it uh, many, many years ago. And to be honest, I, I, I got stuck at a particular point and I stopped. Uh, a bit like reading a book. If, there's, if I get bored or there's something that I don't like, there's so many books, there's so many mods to play that I move on. But as well as the normal version of uh, Heart of Evil and the source version that you're talking about, plus the new source version, there's also a high-definition pack being created at Half-Life Creations. They're building um, Thank God. new models. That, that's crucial because the models, I mean, they did such a good job on lighting and, and the mapping leaves a bit to be desired, but it doesn't matter because you're busy shooting stuff. I think if they just put in better looking models, it would be a fantastic mod, and I would suggest it to anyone who didn't even play mods regularly. I think it's such a good experience, and it definitely needs that. Yeah, it's definitely fun. But, that's all That's all I really wanted to talk about with Heart of Evil. Go ahead, Philip, sorry. No, I was going to say that the uh, the high definition pack is for the standard Heart of Evil. Yeah. It's not for the, the that's one that's, for the, that's been ported for Source or being made on Source, just the standard one. So, made by modders. Which brings us on to this week's question. So, Emmanuel, here's your cue. All right. Airplane food. Come on. Ho ho. Um, actually, wait a second. Yeah, okay. Uh, recently, in the past, I would say year, actually, ever since the drop of uh, Episode 2, especially Episode 2, because then TF2 came out, and it kind of set the new standard for mods, because now you have the Orange Box engine, and now you've revamped an old name like Team Fortress and completely re redone it. So now you have all of these people looking at TF2 and going, why aren't mod developers putting this much time and effort into something? And a lot of people are raising the question, is the mod community dying? Why are there no mods? Why do they all suck? I think that's bull. I don't think the mod community is dying. Uh, as we all know, since we have to kind of actively partake in it, uh, there's always new stuff, and it's still coming out. It used to be where um, if a new mod did something as little as release a model, it was huge because the tools weren't readily available for mod developers to kind of 
get stuff pumped out on on regular intervals. So it kind of showed the progression of of mods, and it meant a lot more than it does it does now because what any 15 year old can pick up uh, a hacked version of 3D Studio Max or Maya and pump out some models, and and bam, you've got press release. But I think the problem is that people are are so involved in their MMOs and um, there are other games that take up their time. Uh, I know a lot of people are now into something called uh, League Play for, for Counter-Strike or whatever game they're playing. That they don't, don't regular sites like ModDB or Planet Philip or Planet Half-Life. So they're kind of out of the loop when it comes to mods, when in reality, mods are still alive and kicking. I hate to hark on Resistance and, Libera uh, Resistance and Liberation again, but this is a great example of a multiplayer mod that came out that did it its own way and did it really well and it's a fantastic mod but there's just no one playing it because they're so caught up in their own their own things at the moment and also there's a lot of there are a lot of games coming out that are so high quality left for dead um, dead space is coming out pretty soon last year we had halo 3 episode 2 portal i mean there's so many games that are coming out at, at, at just that are just so high quality that it just it pulls away from people needing to go and play these mods and in reality the community is still there it just doesn't have the people there Right, I, I entirely agree with you, but I think the reason people think the mod community is dying is twofold. A, I think there's a per perfectionist attitude in the community now. I think everybody thinks that uh, in order for them to release something, it has to be perfect. It has to have exactly the amount of polys that's needed on a model, and those, ty those types of things. When yeah. in reality, they can release a beta, and call it beta. I mean, Google does this... All the time. Why can't mod developers do this? Did you know that Gmail is still in beta, technically? It is still yeah, in beta. Yeah, I know. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Why can't mod developers um, just release a beta and say, hey, we're looking for open suggestions. Here's something that we've been working on for four years. So here you go. This is what we have so far. Let us know what you think. And obviously it's not a final version. Obviously it's not complete. I mean, it works with multiplayer mods perfectly. Definitely. Um, maybe with the single player mods it won't work as well because then you kind of ruin the storyline. But for something like multiplayer, that's definitely an option. And then my second point is, I think now mod developers are lazy. And I think they can get away with a lot more now. You Back in the day in, say, 98, um, when you, you said, I'm making a mod, you better have information about that mod every week, and you better stick to a release time. But now... Um, people say, oh, we're making a mod, it's, you know, it'll come out when it's coming out, and we're not going to give you much more information. They're not as dedicated to the readers and the hardcores as they were back in the day. I agree, I agree. I think one of the things we need to also consider is that these people generally don't have management skills either, and mods nowadays, they need to be managed in the same way that a game does or any other serious enterprise does. There are a few people who are making mods on their own, but the really good ones are generally made by a team or somebody incredibly dedicated. And these people are not very good at managing themselves. I'm not just talking about time management. I'm talking about management within a team, management within promoting themselves and thereby keeping the motivation. I have to agree tenfold. In a, in, but Well, I agree, but I'm not going to say that that's the whole reason. I mean, look at Firearms. There's a whole debacle. I'm talking, the game, Half-Life 2 has been out for four and some years now. And the mod has been in development for like six, Firearms Source. And they, it was just a huge nightmare. They had two teams split up. Then there was supposedly a third team that was coming in. And no one knew what they, was do, what they were doing. Now there's two mods, and now it's this huge drama. When, do you care? Do I care? Do the people playing it care? No, it's just... It's all stupid. It, it, we don't. All we care about is what comes out or not. And it's so silly that these people just go into these tangents about who has rights and who doesn't. And it all could be avoided, like Philip said, if they just set a game plan, if they followed that game plan. But I'm not saying that. I, I think that that's part of the problem. And that's part. I mean, if if there were more mods dropping consistently of better quality, obviously more people would be staying. But I think the bigger problem is the community of people who play them. I don't think that. I mean, again, going to go back to RNL here. I, they released something brilliant, uh, especially for their first release. And as we speak right now, there's only like two servers of of people playing right now. When there should be like 
four, five. I, it's just it's it's sad. I remember a game called Opera coming out, and it was not in the least bit finished, and it still managed to pull so many people to come play it. And you could, and even though there was three games in that genre, you had the specialists, you had the uh, opera, and you had Action Half Life. People flocked to all three, and it wasn't there wasn't competition or anything like that. It was just there were so many uh, more people out there to to play them, and that's sad. I, I think that it's our fault. It's the people listening to this podcast. I think that we all need to 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 partake in the community community a little bit more, start playing more mods. I mean, come on, what are you doing that's so important? A job? <laughs> Blow it off. You can play at work. I, I understand <laughs> what you're saying. Uh, um, I think. It's also important that when we make comparisons between other types of uh, entertainment, for example, if we talk about a film or a book, we need to realize that these are limited time things. You can watch a movie, hour and a half, it's finished. Yeah, maybe you watch it again. You can read a book, okay, depends on how fast you read, maybe a week, maybe a month. But these games, they take longer. And not only that, some of them you can just play for hours. Perhaps what we have is we have too many games, too many mods, and just not enough people. And it's easy to blame the people for not playing, but maybe there's just not enough people. So what should we do? The, the, so that's what I think. I don't think it's the mod, like, going back to what I said, my, my question is why does everyone think the mod community is dying? I don't think the mod community is dying. My answer is I think that the people, the players are dying. I think people are so busy, or it could be that people are just getting older. They just don't find this stuff interesting anymore, you know, and that's kind of sad, but it, it's, it, it, it might be true. I think that we need to bring in new people. I think when Left 4 Dead comes out, it's going to bring more people into the community, which is good. It might pull them from Call of Duty 4. It might pull them from World of Warcraft. Um, a lot of people like to drop the, the blame game on World of Warcraft and other MMOs for saying, oh, well, why would I spend three hours playing a mod when I could spend three hours grinding for elementals and get my character advanced in a consistent um, environment where ever, all my work will be shown, whereas in a mod, it's just it's not persistent. It's just... It's just something you do for fun, and no one does that anymore. I think everyone's turned, uh, get, well, yeah, PC gaming into into a chore almost. I agree, and there's a lot less communication between the community now. Before, you would be able to jump into IRC and just jump exactly. into Half Life and say, exactly. "Hey, did did anybody play, you know, Heart of Evil? Did anybody play Decay?" But that's I, not there anymore. I, I I cannot agree with you more. I. Uh, uh, oh, I, I I don't get it. They all think they're celebrities now. I don't get what it is. I mean, you'll have mods like Dip Rip, who are the nicest guys you'll ever talk to, who you can invite them to be friends on Steam, and they'll totally talk with you. But I've done reviews of mods where I wanted to talk to the developers, and I just could not get in touch with them. Right now, as we speak, I'm trying to do an interview with a mod, and I will not say the name because they will be very disappointed with me if I was to say their name. Um, and he, it's talking through through email. It feels like I'm speaking to Scarlett Johansson or someone really important and rich or something and it's just so hard to get a hold of them and it's just it's not it's not personal anymore I, I think you know what I think what started was Flara from Natural Selection I love the mod to death and I think it brought a lot of people into the community but that guy set the standard for douchebaggery that is unfounded or unprecedented in any other form of this media he is just great at patronizing people and running his own mod and not listening to anyone else and it's just fantastic and if you guys ever get the chance listen to the podcast um, over at uh, what is it I'll have to get the link to the site All right, I'm going to post a link to their podcast so you can anyways you want to learn about Natural Selection Source because it's going to be awesome but it will give you an insight as to what the, uh, the mod community is kind of turning into but, you know I'm going to have to totally agree with what you're saying about Flayra I don't want to knock them too bad. We got to keep moving, but I just want to mention this real quick. Um, when Natural Selection was in development, Flayra had a unique ability to do incredible public relations. That's what's lacking with a lot of community mods. A lot of people can't um, advertise their mod very well, which is why it's not getting out to the greatest number of people. But Flayra, on the other hand, created a way, I don't know how he did it, but he made everybody know about Natural Selection. He made that game known across the world. And through that, he became an instant celebrity, obviously, and he had to deal with that. I want to give him some credit, um, because I don't want to knock him too bad, but um, dealing with that is probably insanely rough. And hopefully we can become yeah. a celebrity. Yeah, well, being, as we all know, now that we are celebrities for having a podcast about Half-Life, 
w I think we deal with it pretty well, right? I mean, the constant barrage of women throwing themselves at us and uh, movie deals, it, it's not that bad. And I think you have to keep you have to keep yourself in check because when it comes down to it, it's not it, you're you are selling your mod. It's just like you if you are a businessman or whatever you're trying to sell a product. It's that's that's part of the game. And I feel so ashamed that I have to work so hard to to get in just something as simple as an interview. Or I, if you guys go to MIRC, it's so hard to talk to developers or anyone who has any leadership in the mod. Um, I guess RNL is my mod of the week because I'm going to say that if you go to their forums, it's still active. The the developers will actually talk to you in the forums, and I think that's really important. I mean, Counter Strike. If you go back and, and look at how it developed, a lot of it, uh, a lot of its success comes from the mm -hmm. fact that they listened to what the community said. They they didn't just go their own way. They that's what the mods for. It's for the community. So mm -hmm. why don't you listen to them and, and and obviously do what they want? Comes back to my point about management. I mean, uh, w when I was on the team with Strider Mountain, we very de we decided very early we needed a PR guy, and uh, if teams don't manage themselves including PR, then that's bad for everybody. But you're right, William, we need to move on. And we're going to move on to something called the trivia point. I'm going to ask a question, and perhaps the uh, celebrity guests here will be able to answer. If not, perhaps the listeners will be able to answer. Maybe it's an easy one for you. I don't know. So here's the question. Who is Dyson Point Care? Do you guys know? The maker of the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> the purple one. Right? Yeah? What's my prize? Close, but no cigar. William, do you know? I really don't. I don't want to Google it, um, and I like I want to try to dig within my brain. So I'm going to try not to Google it. But I haven't heard this name ever. Okay, well let's just leave that open for the listeners. If you know who Dyson Point Care is, then please comment should on I, this particular podcast. Should I read should the uh, Wikipedia entry? No, because I can't. Are you not. sure? Actually, th <laughs> there is a clue in. Um, half secret. That's just a complete coincidence, but there's a clue. So that's that. I'm going to move on very quickly oh. again. Sorry. Next portion is called Website of the Week. And this week, um, I'm going to mention a website called Necromanthus. Uh, there'll be a link, so you won't have to worry about how you spell it or what you do. But basically, this guy has created a portion of Half Life in Shockwave. And don't sort of go rubbish until you play it because it's incredibly representative of the real game. Yeah, and don't don't let the opening flash turn you away because it might be the worst flash ever created. It be when you get past that, it's actually pretty cool. Yeah, I liked it too. Uh, to be honest, I was I, like I like like Emmanuel said. I immediately saw that flash and I was like, "What is Philip making me play?" But, <laughs> But I saw the, I started playing the game, and it's really awesome. Too bad it's only like five minutes long, but I can imagine how much work was put into something like that. Yeah, and this is this is a good example of of ingenuity and and just I mean this is proof that the mod community isn't dying. I mean we're getting really cool weird stuff like this, and I think that's awesome. Yep. Did you guys play any of the other games? He's got Quake, Doom, um, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, plus a few others. And some of the others you play for like a long time. Well, how does he do it? Does he port over? Does he have, did he write a, 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 like a, a program to port it over into to Macromedia or something? It just blows me away how he did it. Yeah, no I would idea, have no but idea. But he does... He does thank Valve for their help, so I'm assuming that they sort of supplied perhaps some assets or something. Possibly. You know what was really interesting, though, too, aside, um, with this whole thing, is that he wanted to cover a whole bunch of stuff. It's not just the beginning. It's not just the tram ride. Actually, I don't even think the tram ride's in it, which is awesome for Emmanuel. Um, <laughs> what he did was he kind of linked certain sections of Half-Life, and you don't even notice you're transitioning between these sections. Um, it is only five minutes long, but you get a good idea of the entire beginning of I guess, the Residence Cascade. Um, but you don't notice your transitioning. It's really cool how he did that. Yeah, it's I, I, I adore this kind of reverse engineering almost. And um, actually, Philip, now that I think about it, I think he was thanking Valve just for letting him not have to buy the license or anything. I think he might have done it all just by himself. Yeah, you're, you're probably right. It's probably just a sort of a, a hat tip to them at the end. Yeah, which is even more impressive. I mean, I mean, 
why doesn't this guy just get the Source SDK and bang out something amazing? Okay, so if you get some time, visit uh, Necromanthus. The link will be on the uh, website, so you'll be able to uh, visit and play. And as everybody said, ignore the flash at the beginning. It's, it's a little annoying, but it's worth jumping past that. Luckily, there's a skip intro link at the bottom. Uh, you might want to click that as soon as you see it. <laughs> might be crucial. Anyway, moving right along, you want to close this up, Bill? Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for being on the show. I want to thank uh, Emmanuel, a.k.a. No PK, William, my co-host. I don't co -host. want to leave. I want to stay. <laughs> uh, TBB, which is the PR guy from Strider Mountain, and Spy, the, uh, the mapper. So thanks for everybody. Thanks to Nick, our producer. Thanks for keeping us on track. More importantly than all of us, though, is you, the listeners. Thank you for joining us again this week. As always, you can catch us on podcast17.com. That contains every piece of information you could ever want to know about the podcast, along with our email, which is feedback at podcast.com. So if you have any suggestions, ideas, thoughts, complaints, anything, please email us. Anything you'd like to add before I put the final word in, William? Uh, podcast feedback at podcast 17.com you forgot the 17 but uh yeah i just want to say Question. sorry for the ex sorry for the extremely long show but uh we did have an interview but it was fun i had a really good time and thanks for no pk coming on the show for the first time hopefully oh i had a great a time more. when's the next uh when's the next show when are we going to be able to listen to that we record every sunday and the shows come out uh you Hopefully Monday. We shoot for Monday, but if we're a little bit late, it'll come out on Tuesday. And maybe next week, if there's some hardcore listeners, uh, we can have some... You can listen live. If you want to listen live, email us. Uh, email us at feedback at podcast17.com. But we might have an FAQ set up in the, on the website uh, on top of near the blog section and everything. We're going to try to write up an FAQ so that we can show you how you can listen live. I think that would be a really great way of getting people listening. Yeah, but it's worth mentioning yeah. they can only listen. They cannot contribute. Right, exactly. <laughs> but there is a word of warning because uh, the unedited version of the show may contain flatulence and or um, bad things. So, <laughs> so you For... see extra. Earlier on, Earlier on, William, you said that you sat, th you, um, sat down and you played Half-Life in one sitting. And the final question for today to be answered in the comment section is, how many of the listeners have actually done that as well? How many of you have sat down at some point during the day and said, I'm going to play Half-Life all the way through? doesn't matter what uh, difficulty setting, easy, medium, hard, but how many of you have actually done that? I can yeah, say and leave your address so we can mail you a pint of Guinness because that's pretty hardcore. I can say that was the first time I've ever done that, though, on any difficulty setting. It was the first time I beat Half-Life 1 on hard, and first time I've ever sat through the entire game without getting up. Any of the Half-Life games. You know, that, and that's something to be proud of, because games nowadays are, what, five and a half minutes long? I mean, I beat Halo 3 in one sitting, and, you know, that's supposed to be a AAA title that took four years to make, you know? Well, wait oh, a yeah, second, it took William. Me did you over say... 12 hours. William, did you say without getting up? Well, I mean, I, I, I ate. I had I actually ate dinner while playing Half Life One. I'm not kidding. Okay. I ate it next to my computer. But more importantly, you did get up for the other necessities like uh, expelling fluids from your body, right? Bathroom well, I breaks. can usually hold that back. I can usually hold back on that. <sighs> That's intense, man. I, okay. Ultimate respect for you. Yes, me too. So thank you everybody for listening, and thank you all the guests. And remember, citizens, it is your duty to resist the combine.